Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah. We're on some heavy stuff here. Woo! You know, the master is looking really tough here. As we get back, and this will probably be uh, part three, or four, I'll enumerate it later. Um, I will enumerate it later as far as being under playlist 16. Let's go. Jeremiah is on fire. We've got lots of Bible study here. I'm surrounded by Bible study. We just went through the first 12 chapters of Matthew. We're trying to get all that organized for a lesson for you, which is revised. I'm very happy with it to give you some more meat to eat and, and to give you some power. The word of God is power. Okay, let's get going. It transforms the soul, enlightens the eyes. It comforts the heart. You better believe it. Let's get going. Let's get into this. Jeremiah greets you with the only name given, lifting up hearts and hands and voices. And let's get into these red letters here. And, uh, and let, let, let me mention that one more time. You know... John, the more you listen to John, and the more you 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 know you get this guy who's a little he's got a little scaredy cat here, but you know he 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 wanted to hug Jesus Christ, and that's our goal here. The, the, John is ahead of his time. You know, our goal here is to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our goal, and to fall at his feet, and to serve him with all of our heart. That's our goal here. And there may be some challenges and developments in, in a lot of Christian people, which Paul talks about in Romans. Uh, I just did a review on Romans. I have a big lesson coming up. I'm going to revise Romans, and I'll probably put it under um, its own category. I haven't decided, because this is really my best yet on Romans. I have some lessons on Romans, but this lesson is going to be a smoker. I'm very happy with it. It's well organized. It's taught. And a lot of people are going to enjoy it. Okay? And uh, it, it's really, really exciting stuff. Paul has a lot of heavy things to say. And, and, I, have, and, and I spend a lot of time on this. So, uh, and I, I may put it under sound doctrine. If I have a lesson and I don't really have a category for it, I'll put it under category number two. And that's going to be the, 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 the mixed bag in these playlists. Everything else is going to be item specific, okay? Pretty much item specific. I have a 30, what's that, 37, where I talk about third heaven. And uh, I might add something under there. 37 is, uh, but as, as you get farther along in my numbers, you're getting into, you're getting into small subjects. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. These playlists are very deep. That's why I have an introduction to some of these, and it's just a lot of deep stuff. Grace, mercy, peace, and rest are huge. I already have an introduction for those four terms. Okay? And when I go through the book of Psalms, I'll probably put some of those lessons, as I read through, I'll probably put them under grace a lot and mercy because David and his buddies talk about grace and mercy a lot. See, see how this is unfolding here? This is a living organism here. I'm putting this together on the fly. Now, I have years of experience in working with this, so I'm not, I'm not a tenderfoot. Or, 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 or as your Old Testament uh, Hebrew says, abib. That's a tender shoot. A sprout. I'm not a sprout when it comes to this uh, uh, New Testament, especially here, okay? I've been around the block a few times, and I'm really happy going through a lot of stuff now recently. We're really, we're really getting through a lot of uh, text here uh, recently. I mean, we're sizzling here. We, we have, and I'll let you know what, what's going on just behind the scenes, just before we get into uh, finishing Revelation chapter 1 here. Uh, we have... Uh, ooh, we have beauty going to one and two in, in my time zone, not your time zone. I'm very happy to get back into chapters one and uh, two and three. I'm sorry, that's for beauty. I'm going to go through chapters two and three for Revelation, not beauty right now. Okay. I'm giving a different approach to both chapters. So there we go. 
a very exciting time in Proverbs, looking at uh, trust in the, in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. We, we, we talked about the continuity in uh, Solomon's uh, first three chapters or four chapters where he mentions commandments as the key. And don't lose commandments. Then I pointed out how the great-grandfather uh, paved the way for the great-grandson to say the same thing, except for the great-grandson talks about commandments in an even, in even a more serious context. And I pointed that out. These are exciting times. You know, we, uh, we, we just went through Psalms. Where, where we talked about sanctification. We talked about um, uh, wisdom in chapter 1. We talked about uh, leadership and rulers and who's Lord and who ain't Lord. And why, why do you want to try to be Lord when you're wasting your time in chapter 2 of Psalms? And you have an opportunity to serve the Son. You better be about the business of seeking the Lord. That's the key. Chapter number 2. 3 and 4, David's in trouble. But he's very confident, and he's going to tell you why he's confident. And he's going to be excited about being delivered from his troubles in chapters 2 and 3. And how you should wait in all of this. So the, the, this is, we are smoking here. Let me get a wet my whistle here. Pardon, this is hot. This is a hot weather here. Jeremiah, get going. This is good. Don't stop. This is good stuff. The unveiling, the uncovering, apocalyptic. Apocalypt. Uncover a little bit of what's being, of what's hidden. And for we who have Christian parents like me, uh, we are really excited. My parents are American Quakers. We're, we're, we're immediate descendants of William Penn here. And the blessings of being a descendant from William Penn are extremely significant. They had that famous song, Born in America, Living in the USA. There are a lot of very significant things about we who are Amish-related people here. We were handed the oracles. We, we were given the, the path of life. We were given the answers to questions about death, uh, uh, everything. When I met people in school at, at the university, I, I've, been to, I, I've, been, I've been involved in three universities in my life and three coast colleges or three um, community colleges. One of them on the coast. A lot of people I met there, they didn't have parents like me, and a lot of them were from other countries. They don't know what death is and how, uh, uh, for, is, is it appointed once for a man to die. They don't know all these things that I know, and when I hang around them, I realize just how good it is. Woo, I'm here to tell you psychologically, intellectually, uh, if, you're, if you have an Amish-type family or whatever, you were given a silver spoon. You were given the silver spoon of intellectualism. And you need to rejoice. Those of you who, who have had that opportunity. I have a movie where the, the, there's a gangster who meets a, a, up, an up, uppity lady, and she's a beautiful lady, and uh, he, he talks with her, and he gets mad at her because he thinks that she's, uh, she's putting him down. And she's not putting him down. She's just uh, putting up a, a temporary roadblock because he's a gangster. She has a right to do that. And he tells her that you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth and you should have come out as an intellectual, well-educated, uh, take advantage of your opportunity person. And that is not a minor observance. That's one of the best lines in the movie. Why? Because you are given opportunity. I was given golden opportunity. 
the Quaker type family. Oh, uh, whoa, dude, you just got a lot. You, you got a lot of privileges. That 99% of all humans that have ever lived never had the opportunity. Easy 90%. Easy. I don't have any exact quantifications on that. Okay, let, let, let's, let's get back into the lessons remaining here. We, we bounce around a little bit here. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive or I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Write these things which thou seest, or thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So what the master does is he's giving him, he's giving him some metaphors. He's giving him something comparison to, such as seven candlesticks are seven groups of people. Whenever the Bible gives you something as a metaphor, it will explain the metaphor every time. Because the Bible wants you to read something and believe exactly what it says. I spent a lot of time reading the Bible in my first channel, but I didn't spend enough time as I really wanted to, because we're giving a lot of definitions and vocabulary on my first channel. This channel here, we're going to do a lot more reading, and this is more for advanced people, but it's also for lower ages too, because we're not going to get into a lot of what we call in America negativity in this channel. This channel is going to be basically no discussion about things that are harsh. Uh, we, we, we'll use the word a mean person. We, we, won't, we won't even identify characteristics that much here at all of bad people anymore. We're basically done with that. Now the Lord here is obviously uh, um, a, a very, very strict, um, he, he's the, he's the He's the warden of the prison. That's what he's telling you right here. And he's not just the warden. He's also the man that locks you up. He's the sheriff. And he's also something else. He's the judge. He's wearing quite a few hats here. And what's happening here is we have an amen that the Lord was once dead, or he went through the process of dying in a human body. But he couldn't die, and his body couldn't die permanently, because he never sinned. If you never sinned, if somebody attacked you and killed you, you would come right back up to life. That's the point. Because you can't die. The Master is telling John here, that he basically couldn't die. He, he, was, he was murdered, but he, he couldn't die. He still lives. And the reason why is because he loved righteousness and he was obedient to not sinning one time. Then the amount of punishment he received was, was considered enough for the replacement punishment of every human being so that he could go to any human being and snatch them and put that adjudication and that removal of sin and place it on that individual individually because he's purchased the entire field everybody okay now he's giving him a time frame you've already seen a few things you're going to see something now, and you're going to see something later, John. I want you to write down all three time periods, or basically the whole book. Now let's continue. We already mentioned he has the keys of hell and death. 
No one can kill you without the Lord's supervision. Nobody. He's in charge of everything that lives. Therefore, if someone planned on killing you or something, they couldn't do it if the Lord didn't want them to do it. We're not going to go into that because that's a little dark conversation. Let's move on. Write the thing, write the thing which thou hast seen. Verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars. I, I want to share with you that when the Lord gives you something like stars or something, it is what? It's a metaphor, and he's going to, he's going to explain what it is. Now, there are a few times in, 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 in this book right here where we see something, but we don't get a clear explanation of it. However, there is a decent explanation for whatever it is. Every single time. Because the Bible wants to have continuity. It, it, the Bible, God doesn't want you to guess at stuff. Just like, when, just like I read uh, 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 Zechariah 1.11 that says, The earth is still. Okay, there was no explanation for what still means. It means it's still. That's the point. You never moved. And you'll never move. That's the point. Here we have something that, that, that represents something else, but, but that representation is going to be explained. Okay, clarify. The Lord's going to identify exactly what the seven stars are and the seven candlesticks. Let's go to chapter 2. I think I'm going to stop right here. I want to talk about something related. We kind of want to jump ahead a little bit here. Let's go to... We'll come right back to this. Turn to chapter 19. Go to verse 9. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So the angel is talking to John. And what's happening is, is that people are going to be delighted when they're invited to go back to the earth with the Lord at the end of the tribulation period. It's called the marriage supper. Meaning, metaphor, God's going to gobble up all the bad people. It's over for them. The game is over. The Lord's going to wrap things up so that there will never be any, anything or any harm to anyone ever again. Never. No more mean people, no more liars. All of that is permanently gone especially at the end of the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ. Uh, chapter 21 emphasizes that. As far as the 1,000-year reign of Christ goes, there might be a little bit of leeway as to human behavior. However, the Bible says the Lord is going to rule that 1,000 years with a rod of iron, which means no one's going to be able to do anything uh, of a felony offense at all. Felonies are over. Serious harm it's gone. That's quite obvious. It's wonderful, isn't it? The reason why I jumped is because the same master that you saw with the white hair and so forth and the feet of brass burning, which obviously means that the Lord has been treading in downstairs. Here he comes again with the same attitude. This time, he's not going to clean the church. This time, he's just going to wipe everything up on a horse with a red robe on. And we're going to be right behind him. And the armies which were... There, there, there you go. We got white horses too. 
And as a matter of fact, there's a famous white horse right now in Japan that keeps winning races. It's, it's the most white, it's the brightest horse that anyone's probably ever seen. The horse is absolutely white. Maybe the Lord will use that horse. But we're going to be on white horses too. And, and what we're going to do is, it's the wine press. Look at verse 15. He treaded the wine press of the fierceness and the wrath of God. What you're seeing is, is the same thing in Revelation 1. The Lord is dishing out punishment. Now, to the, two, to the seven churches, a lot of this is a warning. There are warnings in here. As I said before, we say in America, get it together or leave it alone. Chapters 2 and 3 here. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, right. Ephesus, these, these things... Saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which they say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne. And has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Stop right there. What does the master emphasize most in these seven corrections? Or he's talking to seven groups of people. What he emphasizes is endurance the most. The reason why is because they're already in the church and they're already established. They've already been through the illumination. Now it's time for operating properly. Operating in your church office properly. Which also, of course, has with it endurance. I want you to operate properly Let's get this church in order, and I want you to endure. That's patience. Those are two of the main ideas we're going to go through here. Because most of these churches are basically, uh, as far as their activities go, they're working, and they're serving, and they're planting humans, and they're watering humans. They are fishers of men. They're bringing humans in, and they're serving Jesus Christ, and they're saved. That's the point. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. <laughs> Wonderful stuff, huh? You better believe it. Okay. Let's talk about the name for a moment. And for my name's sake has labored. The name of the Lord means the Lord saves. When you focus on the church, planting people to get saved, watering them so that they, they get watered properly and become strong in the Lord, you're doing your job. And that means the name is being glorified because the name means God saves and he saves by people who are willing to serve. That's how the people get saved. And that verifies that you love the Lord because you're going out for the Lord's purposes. Not necessarily your purposes. Or your advancement. Glorify thy name, Lord, in all the earth. That's what, that's what they're doing. So they're doing a pretty good job. But, but here's the problem that they have and we'll breeze right through that. Nevertheless, I have someone against thee because thou hast 
left thy first love. Remember thou therefore which thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So we're getting into quite a few things here. We're getting into people who worship other people, you know, oh, that's a, that's a movie star, you know, oh, they're rich over there. And that's what the Lord doesn't like. He doesn't like people who are coming into the church, hanging around the church, who are boasting about their accomplishments and how powerful they are and anything along these lines. Let's continue. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat and eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So now we're getting into, uh, are you going to listen to the Lord? Because the Lord uses his own spirit to talk to you. The spirit is an extension of the presence of the Lord. He's talking to John. He's going to talk to, to, to these seven churches. He's going to warn the first church, obviously, that they've gotten away from their first fire of excitement of loving and serving the Lord. One of the first things that happens to people when they get saved is their excitement for the Lord is rather uh, uh, giddy and it is exciting. It's, it's, it's new. This church is starting to go through the motions right now. They're working fine, and they're enduring, but they're not, they're not, they've lost their emotion. I'm home from work, honey. How you doing? That's what they're doing. I'm going to go in and make a sandwich for you, okay? Yeah, I care. Okay, that's what's going on here. Now here we have our first gift, which I get into in detail a little bit in the beauty lesson, which is a tree of life, and we won't get into that right now. They get one big prize, this church, in terms of how the Lord is the Lord will pick a prize pertaining to your situation. The situation in this church is they're not really they're not bearing love fruit right now. They're, they're in a state of stagnation. In spite of the fact that they're going through the motions, they're missing the real fruit. The real juicy, happy taste of love. They're missing it. And that's why they're, they're promised the tree of life. That would be just a, a speculation on my point. But uh, the point, of course, is that it is a tree of life whereby that when you eat the fruit of the tree, it somehow replenishes you in your spirit body, maybe, something like that. Okay? Which was spoken of in Genesis, correct? That is correct. I'm going to stop right here for the day. This is a little warm in here today. We'll get right back to Smyrna. Now, Smyrna, let me give you a peek on Smyrna before we shut down. Smyrna is the second church being mentioned here. And they're, they are also a real church, uh, 1,900 years ago, located north of Syria, Turkey, area Greece. That geographical area, okay? That demographic. Now, these individuals are the second church. Now, the second church is the one that is the one that's facing the most and the quickest and the most sure persecution. In other words, it's like snap, crackle, pop, you're going to go to the lions or something. Or on, or on a stake or something horrible, which we're not going to talk about. But... That's the second church. Smyrna means crushed herb. When you crack something, you can smell its flagrance. But sometimes you have to crack it first, break it up, right? And to the Lord God, people who are willing to stand up under very difficult circumstances for the church and confess their love of the master under difficulties, 
that's pleasing to God. Because that's exactly what the master had to do, and, you're, and we're not above the master. And I don't want to be above the master. Some people seek to be above the master. That, that's not a good idea. We speak long-suffering in sound doctrine. We teach what we just read in Thessalonians. That we are divinely appointed for similar circumstances that our master went through. Okay? And of course, John is finding that out in the previous chapter where he says what? Who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. Meaning everybody who comes to Christ will eventually, essentially, go through some sort of big shaking. John is telling you that he doesn't like the prison. That's what's that's the innuendo there. That's John being very manly and very tough. You know, he, he, he's, he's toughening up here. You can tell if he fell down before the feet of Jesus here in 117 that, he, you know, he's just a man. He, he's a very tough guy, obviously. But, you know, uh, the, the toughest guys, uh, you know, get become afraid. That's the way it goes. I mean, one minute he's hugging Jesus in, in the Bible, and the next minute he's afraid because Jesus is a lot of different people in one person. He's not only going to feed the young, you know, and, and carry them in, in, in his arms uh, throughout eternity and so forth in, 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 in the uh, millennium, but he's also the one who locks up the bad guy. But I am also your brother. Meaning what? He, goes, he uses the word patience too. Who uses the word patience in the next chapter? The boss uses the word patience. Verse 3, and has patience. John has to have patience right now. Even though he's 90-something years old, 100 or so, this is a little difficult for him. He's obviously relatively healthy. And instead of saying something like, oh, God, this is really tough, you know, wow, dude, what does he do? He says that I am your brother in shaking. The word tribulation means John is being shook up here, and he's taking it like a man. That's what's going on here. And what, what is he doing? He's overcoming. 